Dr. Edwards is an associate professor here at the University of Calgary with appointments in kinesiology, School of Medicine, and the School of Engineering. Dr. Edwards completed his bachelor's and master's at California State University, Sacramento, in the kinesiology and health science department. He then went on to complete his PhD at Iowa State University, advised by Tim Derrick, and his research focused on lower extremity loading during running and skeletal injury. Dr. Edwards' research now focuses on the interface between tissue mechanics and computational engineering analysis. As a reminder, I'll first turn it over to Brent for his presentation, and then following, we'll have a question and answer period, and I'll remind everyone then how to ask a question. So with that, thanks, Brent. Thank you, Emily. And um, <clears throat> thank you for the invitation this morning to share a talk with you this afternoon. So, so the bottom line of the research that I'll be talking about today is that fluctuating loads are detrimental. So if you look at something like cortical bone, it has a monotonic ultimate stress around 190 megapascals, but for an endurance run of 10 to the seventh cycles, you can get that same sample to fail at less than 30 megapascals. And so we attribute this phenomenon to something called mechanical fatigue, which is really the nucleation and uh, accumulation of micro damage that we see in the material when it's subjected to repetitive loads. In bone, the damage kind of manifests as these small cracks that form in the interstitial matrix of osteonal bone. And it's not all bad. You can have uh, bone cellular activity, what we call the basic multicellular unit, uh, tunnel through a, a micro crack and, and you know, sufficiently remove that crack or reduce it in size. But um, the theory goes that if, um, if this remodeling process is not active enough, um, and it's not targeting this damage, then the damage can coalesce or it can grow to some, um, some critical length that leads to uh, failure of that, of that material. <clears throat> and so our working hypothesis uh, in my lab is that stress fractures and other overuse injuries in running are, are a biomechanical event that results from, from, sorry, just give me one second from mechanical fatigue. <clears throat> and so we might have some, let me change this pointer. So we have some load that it gets applied to, to a tissue that has material and geometry properties and uh, to create stress and strain. And that combined with some number of loading cycles or, or cycle duration leads to the formation of micro damage. And that micro damage then adds to our total basal level of damage. And if it's less than some critical value, some DC, then we could have a remodeling response where we would tunnel through, we remove that damage and it would decrease the, the total damage. But there's also theories out there that not all remodeling is created equal. We may have remodeling that creates localized porosities which in turn creates elevated stress concentrations and more damage accumulation. And so we have this sort of positive feedback loop that go on here until we reach that critical damage threshold, which results in injury. In addition to remodeling, we can have adaptation, which maybe for bone, it's easiest to think about uh, uh, laying down new bone on the periosteal surface of the, of the cortex to increase the geometry and, and reduce the stress experienced by that tissue. And of course, the damage itself uh, leads to a reduction in Young's modulus and an increase in residual strain over time. So it, it degrades the tissue. So this is kind of our, our working conceptual framework for how mechanical fatigue plays a role in, um, in this development of stress fracture. When we start talking about the mechanics of materials, uh, it's maybe easiest to illustrate uh, mechanical behavior on what we call a stress life plot or an SN curve. And an SN curve typically illustrates the, um, in this case, the magnitude of the cyclic stress on the Y axis and the number of cycles to failure on the X axis, what we call fatigue life. Note that the, our, our X axis is a logarithmic scale. 
so that even you know just small changes in stress magnitude can result in in large changes in the number of cycles to failure <clears throat> exponentially large changes in the exponential uh, in the number of cycles to failure and um, and 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 this relationship here is nicely described by this inverse uh, this inverse power law so if we have an injury such as stress fracture that results from mechanical fatigue and we know the mechanical fatigue behavior of the material, then we could maybe do some biomechanical modeling uh, where we get an individual's movement pattern. And maybe we do some advanced medical imaging to get some information about the material properties and the geometry of the tissue. And then we try to estimate the, the resulting stress or the strain that's acting on the tissue, in this case, the, the second metatarsal of the foot, um, you know, during physical activity. And if we know what that resultant stress or strain is, then we can go to our SN curve and we can say, okay, well, if I, if I run X number of, of, of strides per day, then, then, I, then I can determine when, when, when I'm gonna have an injury. Um, and, and that's nice. The problem is that when we in fact look at empirical data that are used to create this curve, it, it kind of looks like this. It's a very stochastic process. Um, it's randomly distributed about this, about this best fit curve. And, and so this now becomes a statistical problem whereby for a given stress magnitude, um, our standard fatigue equation is going to either overestimate or, or underestimate um, the number of cycles of failure. And because we're dealing with a logarithmic curve here, um, these overestimations or underestimations can play an important role in the prediction of, of our injury. So today what I'm going to talk about is kind of some of the work that we've been doing in my lab for the last um, three or so years, um, trying to determine what um, decides or, or, or why we observe this scatter in bone fatigue behavior. I'm going to talk about how we account for the scatter in, in, in our models of mechanical fatigue. And then I'll discuss some previous questions we have asked with these models um, regarding stress fracture development. The first thing that I want to get everyone to, in the room to appreciate is how variable intracortical microarchitecture can be. So this is research that was done by Lindsay Loundigan in the lab, um, who's now a postdoctoral fellow at, at, at the University of Saskatchewan. And we took uh, bone samples from human femurs and tibias, and we uh, cored out these small samples, and we took them to the Canadian Synchrotron facility in Saskatoon, and we got these, these beautiful images of cadaveric bone. And so what you're looking at here on the top is a cross-sectional image of a cored out piece of cortical bone where the white is the bone and all of the black is the void space in inside okay um, and then below are just a few ways that we've rendered the three-dimensional images that we've got and so we're not illustrating the bone here but in fact we're rendering all of the negative space inside of the cortical bone to illustrate the intercortical microarchitecture so so the red is the intracortical vascular network, what we call Haversian and um, Volkmann's canals. Um, people tend to forget that about five to 10% of your cardiac output goes to your bones. So there's a, there's, um, a, a, a pretty interesting looking vascular network that uh, varies considerably between uh, people, sex, ages, disease states, physical activity states. Uh, these little dots here in blue, uh, I hope you can see them, are in fact where the osteo osteocyte lacuna lives. So that's another source of porosity than we, that we see of bone. But I just want you to look at these bones and just think to yourself for a minute, why would you ever expect these bones to behave mechanically similar? You probably wouldn't. So Lindsay and I developed... Um, uh, an initial study to try to look at the importance of intracortical microarchitecture on bone fatigue behavior. And we started out doing this in bovine, where we um, 
collected bovine femurs and tibias, and we cored out small dog bone shaped samples um, from the cortex of those animals. We then put them in a micro CT scanner. And uh, again, I'm rendering the vascular network here. And we quantified things like bone canal diameter, bone canal separation, and porosity. Um, one of the cool things about bovine bone is that it, it adult bovine bone illustrates two different types of bone. It, you can find secondary osteonal bone, which you know, has osteones. It's been secondarily remodeled the, sa remodeled the same way that adult human bone undergoes remodeling. But then you can find plexiform bone. A plexiform bone is not found in, in, in found in humans, uh, but it's found in, in sort of rapidly growing large animals. And it's, it's, it's uh, this very fatigue resistant, but uh, geometry wise, it kind of looks, has this very organized brick-like structure. Pores are very small, but they're very abundant. So these are cross-sectional images of the bone. Here we've rendered the intercortical microarchitecture. And then, and then what we do is we can create finite element models of these bones and we can determine uh, how they behave uh, to an applied load. And specifically what we like to do in the lab is look at how these vascular channels serve as stress concentrations. Uh, because we think that these stress concentrations are playing an important role and the fatigue damage and failure process of bone. So this gives us a model to start looking at how these two different types of bone behave. So we take all this bone and we put it in a mechanical testing device and we cyclically load it, usually in zero compression. What that means is we unload it so there's zero load and then we compress it to some given compressive load. In this case, it's 110 megapascals. And we do that over and over and over again until we get a fatigue fracture. Um, and and we, we like to look at zero compression because we think it's highly relevant for stress fracture because stress fractures tend, for the most part, uh, apart from, um, apart from you know, certain unstable stress fractures that need surgery and whatnot, but the majority of stress fractures happen on the compressive surfaces of bone. They happen on the medial surface of the femur or the per 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 posterior surface of the tibia or the dorsal surface of the metatarsal, which we all, uh, which, which, which we think are all compressive surfaces of the bone. All right, so um, here I'm illustrating the relationship between some of the microarchitectural measurements that we have um, and the number of cycles to failure. And it's broken up into plexiform bone, which is the dark, sorry, secondary bone, which is the dark circles, and plexiform bone, which is the white circles. The first thing um, that maybe you can see is, is that uh, there is a significant correlation between the porosity of the sample and the fatigue life of the sample. If we were looking at secondary osteonal bone, we don't observe any relationship in plexiform bone, although there's not a lot of variation in porosity there. The porosity is dependent on both canal diameter, the size of the canals, and the number of canals. And so if we look at these two variables, we can see that this relationship with porosity is basically maintained if we look at it in secondary bone, if we look at the size of the canals, the median size of the canals present in our sample. And we really don't see a relationship there in terms of canal number. So we use this to, to you know, I, we're, we think these data suggest that the size of the canal is, is what's really dictating the important role that porosity plays in the fatigue behavior of bone. One other thing that's interesting to note is we see a, some, uh, a, a, um, a positive correlation in, in plexiform bone between the number of canals that, we, that the sample has and the fatigue life of the sample. And so what we think is that if the canals are small enough, meaning they're small enough that they haven't re reached some critical size where they affect the mechanical competence or the structural integrity of the, of the material or the bone, then we think that having canals can be a very good thing because it can take those cracks and it can arrest them before they grow to some critical length. Um, if we use those uh, micro CT scans and we uh, um, create finite element models of those bones and quantify something that we call stress volume, 
which is really a, um, it's a measure of the size and amount of the stress concentrations that are that we observe in these bone samples that are under load, then we see a very strong relationship between the stress volume measure, so, so the size of the stress concentrations and the number of cycles to failure. And again, I'll reiterate, we think this is playing an important role and mechanical fatigue. We followed that up um, later in a study using human cadaveric bone. And so these are uh, now you're looking at bone from the femurs and the tibias of, um, of, of humans where we've cored out and we've done basically the exact same thing that you saw with the, with the bovine study. And we took these samples and we loaded them essentially at four different stress levels, um, 90 megapascals. This is log stress range, but it's 90 megapascals, 80 megapascals, 70 and 60. And so, of course, when we look at it as a function of stress, we see a considerable amount of scatter, which is similar to that figure I showed you early on. But if we take these same samples now and we calculate the stressed volume of these samples under cyclic loading, then now all of a sudden we have a much nicer relationship and we can start to, to really tease out what is, what is causing the observed scatter in this fatigue behavior. So we think we've got a, a better way of predicting the fatigue behavior of bone tissue now, um, as opposed to just simply looking at um, stress or initial, or initial strain of the, of the sample. So what about bone as an organ, i.e. bones? Uh, maybe this makes my title make sense now. The fatigue of bone, bone tissue, and the fatigue of bones whole bone, right? Um, so the data that I've shown you right now, and I'll credit EFOS for this slide here, is it's really we've taken uh, bone and we've cored out these ASTM standardized shape dog bone samples. And we do that so that we can do a material test. We try to eliminate the um, importance of structure in these tests. But of course, in terms of a stress fracture, that's not how a bone fatigues. A bone as has a much larger volume and it, and it has a complex shape and it has a heterogeneous material distribution, right? So, so, you know, another question that we have in my lab is how do we go from these types of material tests, these very controlled material tests and, and scale it up to the way that a structure um, would fatigue? So previous research has already shown the importance of what we call uh, stressed volume on the fatigue behavior of bone. So let me uh, break this down for you. This was a study done by Bigley in 2007 with, um, with Bruce Martin at UC Davis. And what they did is they wanted to look at the effect of the size of the sample that they were testing on the fatigue life of the sample. So they created these coupons of bone from, I think it was horse bone. And um, what they did was they created the exact same size shapes, but they changed the length of the gauge. Little coupon here. And so some lengths were 10.5 millimeters, other were 21 and others were 42. And they took these samples and they loaded them at a fixed stress level, right? So. Um, so in this case, I guess the stress is the same. It's independent of total length. And when they did that and they uh, looked at the number of cycles to failure, in this case, you're looking at a linear viable plot. And so it's a, it's a log log probability of failure on the Y and it's a log number of cycles to failure on the X. It doesn't matter. It just note that moving from left to right, that means our samples are failing uh, later, they have a higher fatigue life. And when we, you do do that and you load them at the same stress, what you can see is that for the samples that have the smaller volume, they in fact have a longer fatigue life, despite the fact they're being loaded at the same, at the same stress. So we call this a statistical size effect. It's not only observed in bone, it's observed in other engineering, engineering materials. The fact that it fits linearly this this log log probability log number of cycles to failure plot means that it it's uh, 
it fits another kind of distribution called the Bible distribution, which is uh, the cumulative uh, the cumulative probability distribution for the viable distribution is, is this here. And, and I'm not gonna go into detail here, but all you have to know is that this is a distribution that's used uh, almost all the time in uh, engineering to determine the probability of failure of a material when it's under cyclic loading. <clears throat> and so what David Taylor did in 1998 is show that for, for bone, um, you can you can create a viable distribution that predicts the fatigue strength of bone if you account for the volume of the sample, Vs, the magnitude of the cyclic stress, and then M, which is the viable modulus, which just determines the scatter and the fatigue behavior. And so he showed that if you use this equation that you can determine the fatigue strength of a piece of bone um, for a given number of loading cycles. And, and the line here is theoretical and the uh, dots are, are just experimental measurements from, from other data. So this isn't a best fit line, this is a theoretical line plotted over experimental data. And so we think that the viable distribution that accounts for stress volume is a good way to predict the fatigue failure of a material, or at least the probability of its failure. So if you're asking yourself, what is the role of volume, what is the statistical size effect? The way I like to think of it is it's kind of like this, the weakest chain link model. So if you take a, a sample of bone, a very small sample, say it's 50 to 150 millimeters cubed, and you do histology on it, you might find a micro crack density of around 0 0.2 to 2.9 millimeters cubed. So, so not a lot of cracks in a very small sample of bone. You're talking about if we go with the lower end, 0 0.022 crack per millimeter cube density, 50 millimeter cube sample volume, you're talking about 11 cracks. But now if you extrapolate 50 millimeters cubed up to the size of a human tibia, all of a sudden you're talking about 2000 potential micro cracks that could be in that material. And so it's kind of like the weakest chain link model and that the more chains that you, the more chain links that you put in the, in the chain, the more likely one of those are to have a critical defect, the more weaker that chain is going to be as, as a system. So theoretically, it's been shown that the, um, that the viable distribution or sorry, that stressed volume uh, plays an important role um, it's been shown empirically in small bone samples that it plays an important role, but um, had not been shown empirically really um, in whole in whole bone. And so um, Ephos and I developed a, Dr. Hader and I developed a study um, that took place over the last couple of years and are now published in, in JOB where we fatigued uh, the lower extremity limbs, so the tibias here, of New Zealand white rabbits. And before we fatigue them, we uh, put them in a CT scanner and we get their images of their bone. We then take those bones, we pot them on either side and we cyclically load them until they, in, until they fail. And, and we like the rabbit tibia as a model because I mean, there's some subtle differences, but for the most part, it kind of looks like a human femur. It's just kind of smaller in, in, in scale. Sorry, tibia. Um, we took these whole bone samples, these rabbit tibias, and we loaded them under three different conditions. We, we loaded them in uniaxial compression only, which is going to be, which is here, which is the 50-0 group. And then some of the samples we loaded at um, in uniaxial compression and uh, uniaxial tor or sorry, and torsion. And then some of the samples were loaded in uniaxial compression with an additional amount of torsion. So what you see here in these numbers, 50, zero, we're loading it at 50% ultimate load in compression, 0% and then 0% torsion. So there's no torsion. Here we have 50% ultimate compressive load and 25% ultimate torsional load. Here we have 50% ultimate compressive load and 50% ultimate torsional load. So the amount of, of superposed torsion is getting progressively larger here. Um, 
Then of course we created some finite element models of these of these samples, so patient specific or in this case specimen specific finite element models, which we can use then to look at the the the, the stress distributions and the stress volume of these samples. So first I'll show you the results of our uh, of of the, the experimental results. Um, <clears throat> Interestingly, and I, I guess somewhat expectingly, we saw that superposing torsion on top of um, uniaxial compression uh, significantly decreased the fatigue resistance of the material. And, and, and that makes sense, right? You're increasing the infective stress environment of, of the material. But it, it also does seem to uh, suggest that perhaps torsional loading does play an important role in in the risk of developing stress fractures. And what you can also see is even in these whole bone samples, we see a considerable amount of scatter that's, that's varying about two orders of magnitude here. And so there's something still that's driving this scatter at the whole bone level. Um, so we took, we looked at certain variables that we could pull from our finite element model. The first thing we looked at is what people do all the time when they try to create finite element models of the lower extremity and predict stress fracture risk. We looked at peak strain. This is the relationship between peak strain in the sample. In this case, it's a pressure modified von Mises strain, but it really wouldn't matter here if I put maximum principal strain or minimum principal strain. The peak strain experienced by the whole bone specimen is not a strong predictor of the fatigue failure of that material. What is a strong predictor of the fatigue failure of the material is the volume of the material that's being stressed above yield. In this case, we're saying yield is 4,000 microstrain, but we could pick a different threshold, 3,000 microstrain, 5,000 microstrain, and it's fairly insensitive. So again, here we have strong empirical uh, evidence that it's not necessarily the peak strain of a whole bone that's driving the fatigue failure process, but it's, it's, it's the, it's, it's the, um, it's has something to do with the volume of the, of the, um, of the sample experiencing high strain, which we think is related to this statistical size effect. Okay. So now I'm going to switch gears and I'm going to finish up by talking about some of the modeling approaches that we've used to try to predict, in theory, the risk of, of stress fracture um, using some certain you know, combined biomechanical um, experimentation with some medical imaging and, and computational modeling. And I'll start with a study that was done by Colin Firminger in the lab. Um, maybe in sort of 2015, when he was starting his master's thesis, there were a lot of case reports coming out that people who were switching to minimalist shoes were getting metatarsal stress fractures um, and other injuries of the lower extremity. So we thought, well, let's see if any of this has to do with how the strains in the metatarsals change when you put on a minimalist footwear. The other thing we wanted to look at was changes in stride length because some people say that if you put on a minimalist shoe, you start to run with a more four foot style of foot strike pattern. And if you run with a more four foot style uh, foot strike pattern, that your stride length is reduced. And so we sort of wanted to, in a controlled fashion, account for those potential things. So we had people run in a traditional shoe at their preferred stride length, a traditional shoe at 90% of their preferred stride length, so 10% reduction. A uh, minimalist shoe, a preferred stride length, which was the same preferred stride length as they had in the traditional shoe. And then again, at 95% preferred stride length. What we saw was that changes in stride length, at least at the metatarsals, didn't have a, an important effect. Um, I don't even think it had a significant effect on the strains experienced by the metatarsal itself. But wearing minimal shoes did, in fact, increase strains in the metatarsal quite considerably. And if we take those strains and the stressed volume and we do this viable analysis to try to come up with the probability of failure, we can see that the 
the, the probability of failure increases much more rapidly when you're wearing these minimalist shoes than when you're wearing a traditional shoe. If you are fixated on the absolute values of the, of the graph, um, that's good. I encourage you to do so. But just note here, we are, we're, we're really only modeling the, the bone as an inert material. We are not incorporating any elements of bone remodeling or adaptation, which would presumably change these, these probabilities of, of failure. So I'd hesitate to look at the absolute values on the y-axis. Okay, but we can incorporate a remodeling and adaptation response, and we have done this. Um, this is something I did during my PhD. I don't love doing it because at the moment, it's not an incredibly sophisticated approach to modeling bone repair and adaptation, but we can use the viable distribution to quantify the fatigue behavior of bone. And then we can use another probability distribution to quantify the probability that bone remodeling will occur. Where in this case, the, 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 this is still a viable distribution where V, the viable modulus, kind of determines the randomness in the ability for the bone to, to remodel. But it's really only a constant or a function of time, I should say. And then we can also incorporate things like things like adaptation and whatnot. And, and again, if, if we do this, and, and Dave Taylor in 2004 showed this, that uh, repair in theory reduces the probability of failure uh, more so than adaptation, but both um, seem to reduce the, the, seem to bring down the cumulative failure risk of stress fracture. And so um, in 2009, we kind of used that approach to look and see what happens to the risk of stress fracture when you have people run at a reduced stride length. What happens to the risk of stress fracture at the tibia? And so we had people run at, uh, you know, sort of a, their preferred running speed. I think it was around on average 4.4 meters per second. And we do sort of this musculoskeletal modeling approach to quantify the strains in the tibia. And then we, then we take it a step further and we quantify the risk of stress fracture or, or what it may be the probability of failure accounting for repair and adaptation. And what the model suggested is that if you do decrease your stride length by 10%, that you can in fact run an additional two miles per day and maintain about the same risk of getting a stress fracture. So you, you decrease your, your, your um, stride length, the strains go down for a given step, right? But you know, at the time people had a question, well, if you decrease your stride length when you increase the number of loading cycles, uh, which might be detrimental. Well, the, these, this model would seem to, to suggest that it's um, that the, the benefits of decreasing the strain magnitude outweigh the detriments of increasing the, um, the, the number of cycles for a given running mileage. Um, we can also look at the model this way. In that model, we simulated about 100 days of uh, in silico running, if you will. So 100 days of running either three miles a day, five miles a day, and seven miles a day. And if you look at the, the, what the model predicts, it predicts that the risk of stress fracture is really gonna plateau and level off at about 40 days of training, indicating that if you haven't gotten that stress fracture within that time frame of a, of a new training regimen, if you didn't get it within about 40 days, you're unlikely to have that stress fracture afterwards. <clears throat> um, and so I, I really had, you know, this was done in 2009, part of my PhD thesis, no way of really verifying these modeling results uh, at all until this year, until 2021. So um, <clears throat> this year, a very nice study by um, Clethermes, uh, I hope I'm saying that right, and, and Brian Heiderscheidt's group at the University of Wisconsin, published a prospective study looking at stress fracture risk, what they call bone stress injuries in collegiate cross-country runners. And what they found is that a higher step rate, i.e. a shorter step length, was independently associated with a decreased risk of bone stress injury, whereby a bone stress injury risk decreased by 
for every one step per minute increase in step rate, which, which I think is a, is a pretty impressive statistic. Uh, interestingly, for those loading rate lovers out there, an association between loading rate and bone strain, bone stress injury was not detected, despite these often being suggested as primary markers of running injury risk. And then uh, uh, another study, Cardoini, um, along it, from Julia Hughes group, I think at, at, the, at the US Department of Defense, they recently showed in a retrospective cohort study of US Army soldiers, N equals 700,000 Army soldiers with 14,155 stress fracture diagnoses that the risk for stress fracture increased basic training steeply in the first weeks, so three to four weeks after basic training, and peaked in an overall incidence of stress fracture diagnosis occurring during weeks five through eight. And so 40 days would put us somewhere around five to six weeks of training. So, you know, I, I'm not saying this is a validation of the model by any means, but I am saying that it, it, it is nice to see that some, there, there, there is some support to, to verify um, some of the findings of the model from 2009. So uh, that's it for me. I'm gonna summarize here and say uh, that mechanical fatigue is heavily dependent on the resulting stress and the resulting strain from the applied mechanical load, okay? So it's that inverse power law, don't ever forget that. You can theoretically uh, change, change an injury risk profile with just small subtle manipulations in the, in the loading magnitude. Second, microdamage accumulation is a stochastic process. It's hard to predict, but we think that tissue microarchitecture is playing an important role in, in the fatigue behavior. And, um, but unfortunately, you know, in vivo, we cannot, we cannot use in vivo imaging technology to quantify intracortical microarchitecture very well as of yet. Um, the fatigue strength of whole bone is a strong function of the volume of bone under stress. I don't know if this means that larger people would have an increased risk of stress fracture or not. I, I, don't, I don't think so. Um, and then finally, the, the probabilistic modeling uh, that we do accounts for the observed scatter and fatigue behavior, and, and maybe a good way to examine the relative risk of different training patterns and prevented techniques. But I think it's a far uh, ways away from predicting the absolute risk of stress fracture in individuals. Uh, so with that, I'm going to thank Lindsay and Colin and Anita and uh, EPAWS and the, and the rest of my lab group um, and some funding sources. Uh, thank you for your attention and make sure you watch the Giants beat the Dodgers tonight at 7 p.m. Thank you. Thanks, friend. Great. So at this time, if I could um, encourage everyone who signed on to Zoom that if you're willing to turn on your video camera for the discussion, just so we can have a, a more interactive question and answer period, that would be great. Um, at, at this time, you're welcome to ask uh, Brent any questions. To ask a question, you can use the raise hand feature in Zoom, which is found under reactions on the bottom panel of your Zoom screen. And if you have any trouble, you can type your question in the chat box and I will read it aloud. <clears throat> Go ahead, Walter. Just gonna start with a technical questions so that people have time to think about what they might want to ask. Uh, so can, can you tell me how you actually get those uh, doggy bone bone samples? Uh, is that uh, like machine done or do you do that by hand or how, how do you do that? Yeah, we do it through machining. And so we, um, we, we core out a cylinder with a drill press then we take that cylinder and we place it on a lathe machine. And then we turn down the uh, middle of the bone 
with the lathe machine. So we get that, um, you know, that, that nice um, wasted geometry, if you will. And, um, and then there's some polishing and sanding involved and things like that. That's, that's how we do that. And then um, actually uh, Andrew now has perfected a technique to, so some bones, sometimes we want to do material tests with bones that are not big enough to core out and do it yeah. that way. And Andrew has a technique now that we can take like rabbit bone and, uh, and, and we can, um, we can basically uh, machine sort of these prismatic beams, small prismatic beams from the bones. And in those cases, we don't load them in, in uniaxial loading. We, we can fatigue load them in um, like four point bending or three point bending. Great, thanks. Art, please go ahead. Uh, I have a question about basically what, what you can predict from uh, imaging. So you, you said that uh, you can't predict everything from imaging, but it sounds like you can actually predict quite a lot. So on that, um, uh, basically cycles to failure plot, uh, it looks like you had a, basically a couple orders of magnitude in either direction of variability in where the bone's going to fail. Uh, but my, my question is, first of all, uh, given sort of today's best imaging, how, how much better do you do when you do incorporate the, um, uh, basically the imaging of the bone? And then um, are there uh, non-destructive mechanical testing techniques that can maybe shave off another order of magnitude or so? Okay, yeah, good question. So um, if you want to get, if you want to do a um, finite element model of the whole bone, then you're looking at something with clinical CT resolution. And in that case, you can get completely accurate predictions of bone geometry and structure and size. Um, and you can get very good um, measurements of bone apparent density uh, for every voxel inside the CT image. And, uh, and that bone apparent density is going to be uh, sort of proportional to the Young's modulus of the material. So you can get pretty good material properties. And then you can get obviously the material distribution, which means that even if, which means that if you assign each individual um, material, uh, uh, sorry, each element in your finite element model, a different material property. So you assign inhomogeneous materials. In a sense, you can capture some of the global anisotropy of the entire structure. Um, what you cannot predict at that scale are things like trabecular orientation, although the majority of the mechanical behavior of trabeculae is determined by bone volume fraction, uh, it's apparent density. So it's, uh, you know, the orientation of the trabeculae plays some role. They don't play that important of a role. Um, you cannot determine anything about porosity. But one thing that correlates with porosity is the um, is if you just limit yourself to cortical bone, if you you, you can calculate what's called the, the volumetric cortical bone mineral density. And that, because a lot of the bone density at the apparent level is determined by porosity. So there's a nice correlation there. So there might be something that we can look at there in terms of looking at the density of the cortical bone. We've never done it. Um, so over at McCaig, um, Steve and co have the extreme CT scanners, which will get you down to a resolution of 62 micron. And at that resolution, we think that that's good enough to get the big pores because, um, I think that the, probably the critical size of a pore when it starts becoming really worrisome is on this order of like, <clears throat> like 100, 150 microns and up. Uh, the size of a resorption cavity of an osteoclast canal is like 200 microns. So, so when you start getting there, I think that that's when it's really detrimental. And so, so we have the ability in vivo to get that kind of resolution in humans, it's just that at this point, it's limited to 
a small local, um, you know, 10 millimeter region of the distal tibia. We're not, um, and I can, unfortunately, I can show you images, uh, those, those microarchitectural images that I show you where it's like the male 77, female 90, you know, next to each other. We see an incredible amount of variation just from different anatomical locations of the femur or the tibia within the same individual. And so now, it's what's not the, like if you have microarchitecture for one location of one person's tibia, will that tell you what it is for the entire tibia? But what's the limitation on location? Because I think I've seen HR uh, PQCTs where um, it was like the forearm and I thought they showed, um, you know, a re reasonably large uh, volume of the forearm. Uh, I suppose you could do image stacks. You can do the forearm too. I mean, it's a peripheral scanner. So you can stick in your foot or you can stick in your arm. And with the extreme CT2, it's got a large enough gantry that they can go all the way up to the knee. And so theoretically you could, you probably wanna do this on a cadaver and not on a human because you wouldn't want to expose them to that much ionizing radiation. But you'd have to sort of piecemeal a bunch of scan protocols together if you wanted to do something like that. Okay, but that actually sounds pretty promising because uh, you guys already know, like say with stress fractures, you already know where they're, they most commonly occur. So then you just have to image, you know, the worst spots, right? That's cool. I actually haven't thought of that. Because um, I, I think yeah, people I, always I, implicate like the middle of the front of the tibia, right? Yeah. Um, I don't think it's always in the same place. I mean, it tends to be in the posterior medial aspect of the tibia. Um, and I do think that the common clinical site, Lee's here, so maybe she knows. Uh, I think it's a little bit probably pretty, it's more distal than where the, the majority of the stress are actually gonna occur. But um, yeah, I, I don't know. Okay, and then maybe I can just ask you briefly about, so are there non-destructive mechanical testing methods that work? Um, people have tried to use ultrasound to try to, I mean, if you're trying to use something non-destructive, you're trying to look for some kind of critical defect or flaw in the material or, or something like that. And so, uh, you know, you can try to image it, but at, at this level, you're not, like even at the micron level, um, well, with the, with, the, with the micro CT image of those small bone samples, uh, usually that's still too low to really see any micro damage. And even if there's a crack, it's probably closed. And so you don't have the resolution to see a crack that might, you know, be um, a penny sized, really thin crack. So that makes it difficult. So what people have tried to do is like use ultrasound to see if they can um, see changes in ultrasound speed that are kind of indicative of, um, of damaged tissue. And I'm not familiar with um, any papers that have really shown that that's super promising. Like Clint Rubin did a study years ago where they had people run marathons and then they did ultrasound on their calcaneus pre and post. And, um, and from what I can remember, they were not able to, it wasn't sensitive enough to detect any changes. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Rob, do you wanna go ahead and ask your question, please? Yeah, Brent, um, I'm, um, as you know, I'm still learning about this sort of stuff. So uh, my, my question was possibly a bit silly, but <clears throat> you, you talked, you had a rabbit there and you had um, males and females, and you're not talking about different body size. And even between males and females, there's possibly a body size difference. Um, uh, Andy Bywiener, um said in one of his papers that 
larger species of animals have greater bone stress. And that, in fact, he took it to the level that they would even have a, um, a reduced safety factor. And it's actually the limitation on how big animals can grow and that larger species that used to exist perhaps could not have locomoted in the same way because they had greater bone stress. How do you see um, a larger animal, a larger species, or going from the rabbit to the human or a large human to a smaller human influencing that? Or, or do you not agree with Andy's idea that increased and increased species at a higher body size would have greater bone stress? Well, I don't know. I, I'd have to think about Andy B. Weiner's uh, thesis there. But um, what, what I, I've thought a little bit about this, this uh, the fact that in, when it comes to stature, men are typically bigger than uh, women. And, uh, but, but for sure, women have a larger risk of stress fracture development. And so I've tried to think about that within the context of this stress uh, volume phenomenon and it doesn't work, right? Because if, if it was stress volume that was ultimately driving this process, then um, alone, then, um, then we'd see larger stress fractures occurrence in males, not females. So there's mm -hmm. something else that's playing a very important role in the phenomenon and, and it's it's the stress magnitude. It's the strain magnitude. So so I would hypothesize that be also because the so when we talk about stress volume phenomenon, we're talking about things that are experiencing the exact same stress. But that's yeah. not what happens with males and females. It's, it's 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 quite more likely that you know because women have smaller bones. Um, that you know they have higher stress and they have higher strains on those bones. And so, and so the strain magnitude effect on fatigue is highly nonlinear. It's kind of what I showed in the beginning based on that inverse power law, highly nonlinear. The stress volume effect should be, should be linear, should be linear. So, um, so, I don't know. It's hard. <laughs> it, it's easy to talk about when you have things that are experiencing very similar stresses. Uh, a little bit hard to talk about when you have these two competing interests of strain magnitude and stressed volume. Mm. Sorry, that's not a great answer, but. So you, do you think that there's a, a limitation on, on the size of an animal uh, and how it can operate because of uh, um, bone fractures? I mean, we see this all the time in our, in our lab, like, like another example of the phenomenon of stressed volume is if you load a sample cyclically in bending versus if you load it in, in yeah. you know, uniaxial compression or uniaxial tension. If you load it in uniaxial compression, let's say you load it to 100 megapascals cyclically, it will fail way sooner in uniaxial compression than it will if you load it to 100 megapascals in three-point bending or four-point bending, because bending induces sort of a stress gradient or a strain gradient, where it's sort of highest on the on at the uh, on the sides of the cross section, and it's basically zero at the neutral axis, and so now there's for for a given peak stress value, the volume that's being stressed is way lower. I shouldn't say way lower. I don't know how much lower. It's lower than in a uniaxial test. And so, so when you look at the fatigue literature for bending samples, it's always, always way higher. When you look at a stress life curve like that, peak stress versus number cycle, number cycles of failure is always higher for bending samples as opposed to uniaxial compression samples because of that stress volume phenomenon, I think. Uh, in terms of small animal, I, you know, I don't know. I, the only examples of 
animals that I know that get stress fractures, you know, are horses and, and, and greyhounds. So horses and dogs, and I, I'm not familiar with other, you know, they get those naturally. I'm not familiar with other animal models what, that, that sort of naturally get these things. Yep. Humans are pretty dumb, right? They'll run until they give themselves a stress break. <laughs> I think the animals are probably a little bit smarter. Well, that's actually also been said of horses and dogs that they'll run till they die. So there you go. that argument will fail. <laughs> Thanks, Brent. Benno, please go ahead. Thank you, Brent. You used maximal stress or strain in your calculations, correct? Um, it depends most, on- Most of them. Depends on if you're talking about the material tests or you're talking about the finite element models. Just depends on which study we're talking about. The, you know, the, typically, when people talk about fatigue fractures, they associate that with loading rate. Now, I haven't seen you make that distinction between forces that are kind of slow and forces that are fast. Is there a reason that you don't do that? I don't do that because I've done a study that shows that loading a bone faster increases the number of cycles to failure. And I'm not the only one. And so if you look and you dig into the materials testing literature and you look to see what the effect of loading rate is on the fatigue life of material, be it bone, tendon, or even cartilage, you will, you will always find that loading the tissue faster and at a higher rate will increase its fatigue life. And this is something that's completely independent of the viscoelastic effect. So, you know, if you, if you, if you load something faster, if it's viscoelastic, you know, presumably the, um, the 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 the, the, the 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 modulus is going to be higher the faster you load it so that would be one explanation for why you know you extend the fatigue life if you load something faster is that the modulus increases but for these studies that we do we you know we're not sh we're we're looking at loading frequencies in the range you know less than 25 hertz and anywhere between like five hertz to 75 hertz, you know, um, you, you, it's really hard to see an appreciable change in, uh, in Young's modulus uh, in terms of a viscoelastic effect. So that's not what it is. Um, the fact of the matter is, is, is um, and, and, and we've shown this and some other groups have shown this, is that the damage is a function of the duration of, of, of which the material is loaded. So the longer it's loaded for, the more damage it can accumulate. The longer each loading or longer in total? Both. Both. So if we just take, um, let's just take something like a sinusoidal waveform to make things simple and just Think about just one waveform. If we load, so if we take two waveforms, one is one hertz waveform loaded to a peak stress of 100 megapascals. Another one is a 10 hertz waveform loaded to a peak stress of 100 megapascals. The, the one that's loaded at one hertz will accumulate more damage. It will survive less cycles. What's interesting though, is that if you take the 10 hertz wave and you cyclically load it 10 times, then the amount of damage that the one cycle at one hertz and the 10 cycles at 10 hertz 
it'll produce the exact same amount of damage. And the area under 10, 10 hertz sine waves or one, one hertz sine wave is the exact same. So what's, what's controlling the accumulation of fatigue here is the duration that it spends under load. So, so I guess to answer your question, the original question is, we don't think loading rate plays an important role in stress fracture risk. No, I would have concluded based on what you said that the active forces during takeoff play any more important role than the impact forces during landing. Yeah. Um, is that correct? Well, yeah, I think it's correct. I, I'm just going to show my screen here again. Uh, so, because this is a, this is a, this is a fun conference, and I, I want to talk about this with my students later. So, um, so here's a study that we did where we took a ground reaction force waveform, uh, which is this gray one here, which we call the raw curve, and it's got an impact force here and whatever. And then what we did is we decomposed this curve into its active components, right? So um, active mm -hmm. components and impact components. And when you, when you decompose those curves, you end up with two curves that look kind of like this, a low magnitude, high loading rate curve, okay? And then you have a high magnitude, low loading rate curve. Okay? And then the other thing that we did was we said, okay, let's artificially increase this impact here uh, to just make it the same height as the, as, the, as the raw ground reaction force. So we have four different curves. We cyclically load these four different curves and we looked at cortical bone and uh, this is what happened. The, um, we caused failure, fatigue failure in samples that were loaded with the raw curve. We caused failure in fatigue samples that were loaded with the active curve. So basically no significant difference in fatigue life between the raw curve that has the impact force and the active curve that doesn't have an impact force, okay? So that's an indication that loading rate isn't important. And then the other thing is if you say, okay, but you know, um, make the loading rate higher or, or something like that. So if you, if you look at these ones that have, you know, the lo low impact and the high impact um, loading rates were really supposed to be curves that determine that impact event, then we couldn't even get the samples to fail at 100,000 micro strain, or sorry, at 100,000 cycles. We stopped the test. And we had a few that, uh, that, that, that failed before 100,000 cycles for the high impact test. So, so these data to me sort of quite convincingly suggest that impact force is not, well, it's not detrimental to the fatigue behavior of the material. And then Benno, this sort of gets at that question that I was trying to discuss before. You know, what's driving failure? Is it the duration or, or, um, or, or the loading rate. So on the left is a stress life plot for samples loaded at different frequencies. I'm sorry, the legend's not here, but if you see a black dot, it means that the samples were cyclically loaded at three Hertz. And if you see, and if you see a open circle, it means that the samples were loaded at nine Hertz. So you know, nine hertz, the, the, it's the sampling frequency, or sorry, the, the, the cyclic frequency is three times as high for the open circles as it is for the dark circles. Now, in this case, stress is on the x-axis, so I apologize for that. But if you load samples at nine hertz, and this is a significant effect here, if you load samples at nine hertz, you have a significant increase in the number of cycles to failure at a given stress level. Okay. And this is in, as you do, you know, compared to three hertz. Now, what you can also do instead of taking those data and looking at them as a function of cycles to failure, you can look at them as a function of time to failure. So 
So forget the frequency here, use the frequency and the fatigue life to sort of determine how much time the sample was under load. Okay, you get the, the area under uh, two hertz, two cycles of two hertz is the exact same as one cycle at one hertz. So if it's the duration that the sample uh, experiences under load, if that's what's guiding damage and fatigue failure, then the two lines should lay on, right on top of each other and they in fact do. And so it's not necessarily the loading rate per se, uh, it's the duration at which the material spends under load. So, you know, maybe that impact is in fact good. not as important as some think it is. Or good. Well, maybe it's good. I don't. I yeah. I I don't know. I'm I'm sure. <laughs> Thank you. I'm not talking about bone health and adaptation. I'm just talking about fatigue damage. Thank you. Thank you. Rob, please go ahead. Brent, if it's <clears throat> if it's the du <clears throat> pardon me, if it's the duration under load, I know I've raised this point before. If you had a duty cycle that wasn't a sine wave, but a duty cycle more like a bone gets exposed to, so you have an impact and then a flight phase in the running leg, and so you've got it open, then you've reduced your duration under load. But secondly, um, so I suppose that's, that's one question. The second question is your bone model is an isolated bone and it's very porous. I assume that by the stage you get it up there, the pores are full of air, not full of blood under some sort of pressure which may change the mechanical properties. If it, I don't know what the blood pressure of the, is inside bone, but presumably that would make a change. Is it possible to conduct the experiment with a bone still connected to an anesthetized animal with its blood supply? So two things are happening. You would do the experiment with a duty cycle that's more like the bone gets exposed to, uh, uh, would have changed the duration under load, the bone pores would be full of possibly pressurized blood. And as well as that, with the duty cycle, you would be getting oxygenation and you know whatever blood brings to the bone. And whether in fact, if you repeated the experiment with a, a good blood supply on the bone, whether you would push these fatigue fractures way out. Yeah, so I mean, the short answer is we're trying to get money right now to develop an in vivo system. So um, where we can start looking at, uh, you know, we can always look at the effects of duty cycle and, and rest and things like that. What, what we're ch sort of chasing right now is the importance of remodeling and porosity and the fatigue damage process because of how important we think the vascular is the intercortical porosity is. And so that's why we really want an in vivo setup to sort of to, to sort of make sure that we can uh, account for those potentially important biological aspects. You know, answering that question, is remodeling in regards to stress fracture a good thing or is it a bad thing? You know, because remodeling you can remove the damage, which would be a good thing, but it also leaves a pore which could be a bad thing. So that, that's kind of like what, what we're interested in asking. Um, but yeah, I mean, we've got lots of questions about, uh, you know, loading, um, rest between, even an inert bone, we have interest in what happens if we let this bone rest between a number of loading cycles. And, and we want to do that study. What people don't realize is how long it takes us to do these studies. So, I'm not even lying. Uh, IFA has just completed a fatigue testing study, just the experimental part of the fatigue testing study that we started in the spring of 2019. The machine has been running nonstop for two years. And he's been, you know, because some of these tests can go for two weeks or longer, 
And if you and because the scatter is so large, if you want to see an effect of something, you need huge sample sizes. And so there's lots of questions that we have. And then a lot of times we have to table things, unfortunately, for logistic reasons. Do you think that your bone pores are full of air or liquid or variable? No, there's no air in there. So it's, it's marrow and 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 blood and water. Uh, right. So there's at, coagulated blood. What could the effect of the of the fluid pressurization be on the on the mechanical environment of the um, of the bone? EFOS could tell you that it wouldn't matter until you started simulating blast type of injuries that you would get in an explosion. It's nothing that we would expect to see between somebody landing with a ground reaction force with an impact peak of 15 hertz versus 25 hertz. That's not where you're going to see any kind of effect of fluid pressurization. Right. I was gonna jump in and say exactly that because like normal blood pressure is in kilopascals, whereas the stresses that cause fracture are measured in megapascals. So you really need to do something really weird to that fluid for it to have any hope of having an effect on the bone. Right. Good. Thanks, Brent. Thanks. Brian, please go ahead. Thanks. Brent, really compelling work, especially the, uh, you know, impact versus active peak loading. Um, the question is, you know, if there if there's no apparent effect of loading rate on the fatigue life of bone, and and there seems to be some disconnect between those findings and prospective retrospective studies of those with stress fractures, then is the difference in loading rate between people with a history of stress fractures and those who don't just like a byproduct of some other biomechanical change that has a more, you know, closely is that's like linked to you know strain or something more more closely related to the actual fatigue life of, of bone yeah i mean that's what i but by the way you should be in your car right now going up to oracle stadium um so <laughs> yeah, yeah. so yes that's the only thing i can think to rationalize if 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 I don't want to immediately say, well, the studies that found an association with loading rates, external loading rates and stress fracture are wrong. Like they just didn't, they didn't find, you know, it was just random, random that they got that. If I want to say that that effect was real and the only way I can rationalize it in my head is that it's representative of something else that's taking place where maybe there's some kind of association with external loading rates and the magnitude of the strain that the bone experiences, less so the association between loading rate and strain rate. I see, yeah. So, or some, some kinematic change that's resulting in different you know, muscle forces or something. Yeah, sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. I cool. mean, stride length adjustments is one of those things that can do that too. Yeah. Like, um, you know, you can increase your stride length and you can increase your loading rate, but that also increases the strain magnitudes. So, that would be one of those examples where, you know, you're looking at some that external loading measure, but um, you know it's the magnitude of the load on the tissue that's going up. So, sweet, thanks, Matt. Please go ahead. Hey, thanks, Brent. That was uh, excellent as always. Um, yeah, I guess. Just, just to kind of build off that the last question, and you know, obviously there's there's the, the there's a bit of the chasm between the experimental data and then some of these studies, like the military study and the running stride length study, that you know seems to suggest if you change a few things, these stress fractures come down. Can can I ask you just just to just for just for the sake of my own curiosity, where do you think we are in five to ten years? Like, how is the landscape changing for the world of professional sports, sport performance, runners, um, people get hurt, you know, like where, where, where are we five to 10 years from now? And where do you see this heading? Wow. You know, you're always coming with the hard questions that these are not things 
Matt, that I think about, right? Like I, at this point, I'm just trying to figure out what determines the scatter in the fatigue life. And I'm not even trying to think about the clinical uh, ability or the, or, or whatever. But, you know, I, I like to, I like to think that it's, if you're talking about injury, I like to think that it's going to take some kind of uh, measurement of tissue quality. I don't know what that is. Um, so that means there is going to have to be some kind of imaging modality involved. I don't think that wearables alone, things that sort of track movement patterns. Uh, I, I don't even know if we had something that could get you the actual force acting on that tissue. I don't know how beneficial sort of, sort of that would be. So um, I like to think that it's sort of the advancements in imaging uh, modalities that is going to sort of um, maybe take us to, uh, um, you know, and, and, it, and, and imaging doesn't have to be a static thing, right? Imaging could be, you know, like if, if you ask me what would I rather have on a person, like if I wanted to predict tendinopathy, for example, would I rather want to know what their load is or would I rather want to know how the stiffness of the tendon is changing over time? You know, it would be very cumbersome right now to bring somebody into a lab every week during a training season and measure the stiffness of their tendon or look at the geometry of the tendon, but maybe in five, 10 years, it's not. Maybe it's something you can do with a smartphone. I don't know, but I'd much rather have that kind of measure to look at something that would be reflective of how the tissue could be degrading or changing or adapting than I would have any indication of the load that they're under. And there's there precedent for that. If you want to know how people determine if a crack in the, in the, in, in the, in a commercial airplane, if it's safe to fly, it's not because they know how many times it flies, it's because they look at the size of the crack and then they look and see how much it grew in a year. And then they look and see how much it grew next year. And that's how they determine when a wing needs to be replaced. And so that's, um, that would be sort of my, now I'm, I'm not saying that's where we're gonna be, but that's saying, I, that's where I'd like to be. Oh, that's great. It's a great answer. And I love the airplane analogy. I'll probably steal that from me. Okay. <laughs> from you, obviously. Great. I, th I think that was a great kind of big question, big picture question to end on, unless anybody else has any final questions. I'm a little bit upset. I don't get any questions from Walter. <laughs> I have several, but I looking at the time and you having to go back to the class I'll hold those. I'm losing my voice, so I think it's going to be an early, a quick <laughs> seminar. Um, th thank you again, Brent, for, for stepping in to present today, and thank you to everyone in the audience that asked questions. Um, next week's seminar will be by Lee Gable, who will be presenting on the human skeleton and space and beyond. I hope everyone um, is willing to join next week again, and thank you again. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Brent. Thanks a lot, Brent. Greatly Thanks, appreciate Brent. it, Brent. Yeah.